has evolved its support and and you know just its focus on a single customer base that has a lot of advantages um, operationally in, in the marketing way. Volumes you do see increase when you have a wider distribution network. You do see volumes increasing, not always because registrars have lots of other things that they might want to offer, but certainly in the local region, you should be seeing uh, that volumes do <coughs> increase, and and also that you know ideally you would see a, a sort of flowering of value-added services going downstream, provided locally. Quality assurance can be difficult, and we'll talk a bit about this. You do have to kind of do what everyone else is doing in terms of following standards. Um, and, uh, and also bear in mind that when you are dealing with people who are dealing with other registries as well, the more complicated <coughs> the policies are, the harder they are to automate, and the less attractive they may be to that re retail uh, chain. Emily, I mean, there is also regulatory requirements. There is. There are regulatory requirements, I mean. Yes. And this is very critical on this advantage. And I yes. we're going to, when you saw on your slide, but yeah. I mean, this is very important. Yeah. If, you have, if you're operating at CRD, you have local regulatory requirements that you have to comply with. When you have registrars, how are you going to apply that? Correct. And, and you, you know, how, and this is a, a very, this is something that really makes uh, an added complexity and diversity also, you know, and in different countries there will be different regulatory uh, uh, requirements, ranging from nothing in some countries to a great deal and a very high level of obligation, and this is something, no you're right, I haven't actually dealt with that in the slides, we'll come to it a bit when we start to work through the examples of changing policy, but it's something that, that we really ought to explore together as, as the day progresses. So thank you for raising that. <coughs> okay, here are some examples, and I've tried to take the examples from out of the region. Um, Gibraltar and Malta do direct registrations. Um, it was actually quite difficult to find this information, so if any of it's inaccurate, apologies, because I was going on what was publicly available and also um, talking to colleagues in Centre and so on to try to fill in the gaps. But neither of them have a registrar channel, so they were in that kind of the first model. Um, Malta doesn't require you to be actually resident in Malta. Uh, Gibraltar does. To, to, to have a, a registration. There does seem to be a sort of policy to say your domain name has to kind of reflect either your trademark or your business trading name, a kind of nexus type of requirement, if you like. Uh, I'm not sure if there are other restrictions. Malta, it seemed to indicate that there were, but I couldn't find the documents. Um, Gibraltar, there are. Uh, the Fees are sort of converted to euros as a sort of just as a, to, to use one currency, but the registry seems to be charging about 30 euros per domain in Malta and about 136 um, in Gibraltar. Um, I couldn't actually see any Gibraltar names on sale in any uh, registrar, which is, is not surprising because they don't have registrars, but you will see out in the market that many registrars, uh, like people like 101 domains, for example, will act as a reseller even if there isn't a, a formal registrar channel sometimes. So you can see these available on the open market, if you like. We're getting about a kind of 40 something euro markup on each domain from 101 domains, which tends to be fairly low price. And I just couldn't find. Uh, the Gibraltar ones available anywhere. Um, registration data oh, not available. Triangular contract um, UK. There are three and a half thousand active tags, which is the uh, jargon UK uses for an account. That doesn't necessarily mean that there are three and a half thousand registrars, because some registrars have more than one account. Okay? Uh, historically there's been
absolutely no accreditation criteria at all, but there are contractual obligations. So it's sort of, it matters less who you are, it matters more what you do and how you behave. But there has, there's change afoot. There are now three levels of registrar, from fully accredited to sort of channel partner <coughs> to sort of self-managed, which is the um, domain investor kind of uh, registrant as registrar. First come, first served registration policy, quite familiar in the industry. Um, uh, there's no residency criteria, there's no eligibility to be registered. Um, there is a dispute resolution service. You normally find those hand in hand. It's a, if you're a GTLD registry, um, you have to adopt certain rights protection mechanisms like UDRP, and there are others that have been developed for the new GTLD uh, environment. UK developed its own. And in terms of euros per year, it's 480 uh, to register. And you tend to see, I mean, incredibly low margins at the very popular, the most popular sort of, uh, uh, that what they're doing is selling for slightly under cost price and probably benefiting from some, some sort of co-funded marketing or some sort of, uh, uh, or just sort of just taking the loss, you know, in some cases. Services. Yeah, but it's, it's like a gateway. It's a way of getting a client. And, um, the like.com.uk tends to be sold very, at very, very low margins locally. Um, 10.3 million registrations, which is actually a drop in the last year. Um, yeah. Um, of the registrar fee, how much goes to the registrar? The, how much goes to the registrar? Well, at the 921, they would be getting about a five, five euro markup. At the 477, they would be actually paying across three three cents to the registry, unless there's some that in the the registry will be charging the same price to every registrar. But sometimes there will be, and Giovanni can take you through. There are certain kind of like you can earn points or get a reduction and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So sometimes that if you're driving volumes, you're likely to be benefiting from from whatever deals are offered. On pay. And, but, but what this shows is that actually registrants are very savvy about cost. They're very sensitive to cost, as I'm sure many of you will be aware. And they really do shop around and find the cheapest deal. Very little loyalty in terms of who they go with and even what registry they register with. But ten, ten pounds is not is not that much. Why are registrants so savvy about? I think it's just what they used to. And it is, it is funny, but it's like, you know, why doesn't anybody pay for Facebook? Or why won't anybody pay for news anymore? They just have become used to them. So. Could we go back to that quickly? The registration policy says first come, first served. What happens to trademarks and trade names? Tough. <laughs> you have a dispute resolution service. So there isn't, a, um, you know, the, there isn't a sort of uh, a special category or list for preventing certain things from being registered. But actually, you know, it sounds, I can see from your face, horror. Yeah. It's horror. But actually, but, and, you know, ha coming from the background that I've come from, which was a trademark lawyer, and I was absolutely, I couldn't believe this policy. I just couldn't believe it and I couldn't understand why everybody wasn't in court the whole time. And it's extraordinary to see how, you know, so we set up this dispute resolution service because trademark owners were very angry, and this was in the late 90s, when, when it was really not solved yet. Um, trademark owners were really cross and they kept threatening us all the time. Um, and so we found a way for people to resolve their own disputes. You know, so you don't want Giovanni's registered my name. I didn't want that to happen. My fight is with him and not with you as the registry. You will provide me with a service to, to resolve the dispute. But the extraordinary thing was that having done that, that the level of number of cases was 
in you know in this sort of context of about 10 million registrations, it's sort of maybe 150, 160 a month. So it's enough to notice, definitely. But compared with the number of new registrations of maybe 100,000, 150,000 a month, going up to more, it doesn't. It's not even. It's a fraction of even one percent that become a dispute. So it's quite interesting for the natural control type. You, you know, you want to control things and you want bad things not to happen. But sometimes, kind of opening up in that way is not as bad as you fear, as long as you have a responsible way for resolving disputes. And this is something you see in .eu. It's something you see in the .com and uh, GTLD environment. Is that there is a way of doing that? Okay, can you explain on the, on the regulatory perspective, <coughs> in the case of legal system, uh, how is the .uk outside the dispute? I mean, they are they are the anti registering so mm -hmm. how, how did you manage to have it outside the dispute? Well, we were um, fortunate in one way. I don't know, it's, it, there was no regulatory environment. <laughs> or there was no specific regulation. So .uk sort of just existed, and I think this is this is the case. I mean .eu, which we will hear about, <coughs> I think is a very interesting and relevant model for this region because it is regulated, but it's unusual in Europe in having a, a regulatory framework. So there wasn't something that existed, and it was just really trying to discourage. People. So you're relying on contract, and you're just trying to discourage people from. Suing you. Fortunately, there was some case law that, so in the courts, both in the United States and in the UK in the late 90s, there were some very helpful cases that, that found that the registry was not itself liable for trademark infringement. That was really helpful, and most of the industry sort of went, thank goodness, because everybody was worried about it. Because everybody's worried about having some sort of um, liability for is, third party yeah. infringement. Is the UK legal system similar to the US one? I mean, based on precedent? Yeah, I mean, the, the US one is, is sort of based on the UK uh, uh, legal system. Obviously, over the last couple of hundred years, it has evolved in its own way, but it is that same kind of basically a, co uh, a common law system where the, the cases um, uh, help to define the law. Um. Okay. <laughs> right. Who is first? Should we go from this? We'll go from this side of the room and then. Okay. I have a question. Uh, the first question in this slide. So the difference between the fees for registry and registrar doesn't make sense for me. No. Yeah. Okay. So what is the feature that I I I have if I register a domain name from registry and. Uh, if I register the domain name from registrar, this is my first question. Mm -hmm. The previous slide, you said that you have two, the two registrar, many and the, the, sec the first one and the second one, many and the double. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The second one, I, I, saw, uh, I saw that the price per domain name is very high. Mm -hmm. Also, it has two policies for residents and trademark. My thought that the price should be lower than the other registrar, so I could buy a lot of domain names. So what, what, what is this price? So, okay, I hope I've understood the question. The, the registry doesn't, well, it does accept direct registrations, but at a very high, as a sort of last resort thing. And many registries like URID, most registries with a, a registrar channel do not accept direct registration. So it's not possible for an individual to co direct the registry and say, I want to pay you know, five euros for my .uk domain name. So what the registrar is doing is it's booking a domain name in that registry for the customer. It is exactly the same domain name if I went to you, or if I went to you, or if I went to you. Is that that's part of the hierarchical um, arrangement. I, mean, I thought he's talking about the, the previous slide, the one which is the car, and he's talking about this one too. The dot multiple one. Why are the prices so high? 
I think it's very manual system. It's probably, these are not-for-profit registries. I think that in, in Europe, what we have seen in the past uh, 10 years uh, is that the average price, uh, the average fee that a registrar pays uh, to a registry for a, a domain name is, uh, again, the average is about uh, 5, 6 euros, between 5 and 7 euros, let's say. So that's the average uh, fee that is applied <coughs> for a new registration. So the registrar pays that fee to the registry. Um, there's been a tendency, as Emily was saying, to stop direct registrations. And the, the tendency has translated into an action which is uh, either um, setting a deadline, um, you know, after which uh, no more direct registrations, and those uh, who have direct registration, they have to move to registrar, or to set uh, um, such a high fee, annual fee, for direct registration that basically those who had direct registration, they were discouraged to keep having direct registration because uh, having the same registration by a registrar uh, would cost them like uh, 15 euros uh, and direct registration with registry would cost them even 1,000 euros. Uh, and so by doing that, of course, you are discouraged to continue to have direct registration. Why Malta and Gibraltar, they keep such high fee for registration? Um, while it is true that most of the European registries, they have um, like level their fee against the registrants, uh, there are some uh, exceptions. Uh, and Malta and Gibraltar are those exceptions, but there are others. I mean, they are not mm. the only one. So yeah. let's say out of the 45, 50 registries in Europe, I would say 40 out of 50, they have an average uh, standard fee about 5, 7 euros. Uh, and there are some, like 10, which are the exception. That also, as Emily was saying, has an impact on the registration volumes. Uh, because uh, price is uh, a key factor in the registration volume of the registry. So the highest uh, is the price, uh, the fee that the registrar has to pay. Uh, the lowest uh, are the registrations. Uh, and yeah. Gibraltar is also a close country registry with testing requirements. The yeah. testing policy, the testing local president, the testing trademark. So it's exactly. manual. So it's manual and therefore the cost will increase. It's the same sort. Of yeah, 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 that's right. And it, you know, it depends on the choices that you make in the sort of character that you want for the, for the registry itself entirely. So, oh goodness, we had all these questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, quick, because I think we until 11, yeah? Is uh, that what you're doing? 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10.30. 10
this is the industry I come from, of uh, <laughs> trademark enforcement, where you find that somebody has registered your exact match brand in .ng or wherever, Burundi or wherever, and you write and threaten them. And then you've shown that you've done your best. So you can maybe be back with them. Um, well, you know, it's, it's I think, in, you know, to be serious, I think to be serious, it's good to have an answer. And um, and this is one of the, the reasons why registries have, I think, liked having an external dispute me resolution mechanism of some kind, because you can say, don't write to me. We can give you the details of who's registered it. Take it up with them if you've got a problem. I think it's good, you know, it is good to be able to respond in a positive way without actually closing down your registry or having to spend all your time writing uh, those letters or replying to them. Is that okay. okay, we'll go. <laughs> you and then you. Yeah, okay. For authorization criteria, um, when you don't have any criteria, does it mean that the contractual uh, things get more complicated or? So the enforcement gets complicated, definitely. I'm not going to lie to you that when you have a very open door, it solves some problems and it creates other problems. Quality control, enforcement of contract, behaviour in the market. Some of the UK registrars take things to extremes. That's, you know, the contract then becomes all you have. And you have to try to make sure that your contract is, um, you know, allows you to have the tools in your toolkit that you need to handle sort of abusive practices or bad practices. But at the same time, if it's too strict, you're not really going to get anybody wanting to be in the contract with you. Sorry. Yes, uh, my, my question is too early, but I'm asking for the trademark. There are a fun rise period. Yes, and we are in Iran forced to relaunch and the rise. Mm -hmm. There are some rise mm -hmm. and land rush and there are a lot of spirit. This uh, for the survival, for the trademark, there is a challenge. There are uh, trademark trademarks mm -hmm. and a trademark to certain Iraq. Mm -hmm. So after the survival uh, end, does uh, who have the uh, trademark have the distribution? Since he don't register during the trademark, so he don't have no right to anybody yes. else register the domain. That's, that's right, and this has been something that, uh, that there's, a, there's actually been a lot of experience now in, in launching through the GTLD process and actually in the decade before of going through this sunrise, land rush, general availability. And in a way, you're right. You, uh, we see it very clearly in the new GTLD environment that generally the brands are not registering in the sunrise period. That's their choice. Then you get to the general availability um, and they go, hey, someone's got my brand. And you say, well, that was the sunrise period which you could have had. And then there, there are all of these rights protection mechanisms that you need in an open environment. For the very few that do lead to a dispute, you need to be able to say, you go over here, this is the way that we resolve it here. And there are lots and lots of models that you can adapt and learn from and to suit it to your environment that can help you. But the trade, you know, the, the trademarks are not blocked from registration, it's that they get in a way, it's a bit like those running races at school where you give somebody a head start. And if they want the domain, they can get it. But they don't have it forever. Okay. Are we? <laughs> I have a question. A registration data is 10.3 million. Yes. That means 10.3 million domain names. Yes, domain names. And you said at the end that it had dropped this last year. In the last year, I think it's dropped by a couple of hundred thousand, something like that. 300,000. Any known reasons? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you. Um, I think this might be something that Giovanni covers a bit more in the coming days. But there seems to have been a sense in Europe of people kind of holding back and waiting for new GTLDs. 
baby. Mm -hmm. There's also been quite a few policy changes in .uk. It's quite had a turbulent year and introduced some fairly controversial policies like it opened up .uk. Um, and so I think a lot of the registrar channel might well have been not pushing in the same way. Perhaps I'm overly speculating why that is. It's the first time I can ever remember .uk dropping. So this last year you've had less seniors. Maybe less renewal, maybe, you know, certainly the net from, you know, you will always have drop off in renewal about 30% or maybe even more in the first year. 30, 40% in, in that very kind of open environment will not renew. And so, but always new registrations have exceeded that. Um, registry registrar, I chose dot EU. It has 750 registrars. There is a much more sort of ordered approach uh, of requiring technical competence, a prepayment, which is something that's quite familiar in, in the environment as a requirement to put some money on account. It shows that you're serious. Um, I wonder, you know, this is a sort of a, a criterion from before the new GTLDs. I've seen in the new GTLD environment quite a few registries are dropping their prepayment requirement. Um, and there is a voluntary code of conduct, which registrars, I believe, don't have to sign up to, but is there as a sort of, they want to differentiate themselves as particularly responsible and good businesses. There is a, it's generally in the EU first come, first serve, but you have to have an address in the European Union. Um, and so there's a there's a light uh, regist residency requirement. It's the EU and the European Economic Area, which includes uh, Switzerland. It's broader than the the the, clear, the, the um, e European Union itself. There is a .eu ADR. It's similar to the to the GTLD model. It's a little bit different. It's, it's a harsher on domain name speculation, uh, for example. Uh, the fees are four, four euro at the registry, and you tend to see a range of uh, about eight to about 13, 14 euros in the market. So again, uh, perhaps slightly higher margins than we've seen in, in, in others, but very low, really. You know, if you reflect on what domain name prices are in the CTTLDs. Generally, this is retailing at a very low price, and we're just under 4 million registrations as of December. And I think enjoyed a very buoyant growth last year. So the sort of the general rule of, I think everyone was waiting for GTLDs, is not seen across everything. So we can only speculate. The, when you say they are, but you say that the online school could be our online restricted solution, or it's mainly face to face documents and so on. I mean, do you have, do you have an ODR also? It's completely online, so there are no hearings. There it's ODR. It's ODR. It's ODR. Yeah, it's not people sitting around yeah. tables. Do you have um, an oral certification? With the EU, the EU. Is for, for the registrars? Yes, for the registrars. So Do they have to recertify every year? year? No. No fees? No, the, the fee, the, the prepayment, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, we'll discuss that tomorrow. The prepayment is uh, um, the, the initial prepayment, uh, and uh, um, there are currently um, interesting discussions ongoing uh, in the .eu environment if to abolish the prepayment. Uh, uh, or not, uh, but it's just one of uh, fee, initial fee, and uh, uh, we have also a second fee, which is uh, 2500, uh, which is called um, the starter registrar fee, and that's for uh, small and medium enterprises uh, uh, which like to become uh, accredited registrars, but they do not have the 5000 uh, luxury, let's say, to pay in advance. So we give them a sort of a 50% discount, but after two years, uh, they have to upgrade themselves uh, to the standard uh, 5,000. It's like an onboard, a slow yeah. onboarding to yeah. encourage us in the business. Okay, I'm just going to just 
conscious of time, I'm just going to whip through the rest of the slides. So I think uh, it's worth just dwelling for a moment on the differences between being locally accredited with your CCTLD and being ICANN accredited, because people talk about accredited registrars and they're actually talking about two different things. Um, normally, normally it's much easier to become accredited locally. And when you look at, um, you know, but, but also CCTLDs are independent of policy making and sometimes so their criteria might be different from the, the sort of the international standard. But, uh, okay, this is a great chart, isn't it? Can anyone see a single thing on it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm not going to do a dramatic reading of any of it. The message here, okay, is that where you see European CCTLDs that have got high registration volumes, you look back and they often have a lot of accredited registrars according to their own accreditation criteria. So UK has, so at that stage, when I did this 2012, there was 4,000. Um, in the Netherlands, tiny little country, sorry if there's anyone from the Netherlands here, webcast, but in an incredibly successful CCTLD, 1,700 locally accredited registrars in the Netherlands. Um, .de, they're, they're, they've always been a little bit more choosy, but they're still nearly 300. And when you look back and have a look at those locally accredited registrars and say, well, how many of those are we seeing going on to be ICANN accredited? It's usually a small percentage. And almost a bit like Giovanni was describing about the sort of small business onboarding, what you tend to see is that people will start locally, grow their business, and if they're doing well and like it, in a few years they might attempt to become ICANN accredited, which requires months of filling in forms and lots of, you know, lots and lots of very focused form filling in is required for ICANN and a lot of uh, compliance with technical standards, which the local, so the local CCTLDs in a way can provide a real nurturing for the local industry. And that's, I hope, something that we can explore a bit more, is that, that you know, we looked at the sort of, the network effects of getting a nice, vibrant registrar network locally, and getting your CCTLD into the market. But you're also, in doing that, will be nurturing all of those value-add services that the registry is not often geared up to provide. So. Just to um, review all the things that we've covered, and thank you very much for all your participation. Uh, for UK, is there a reason there is no uh, registrar's business in the country? If there's can, you, no can you come back to the... I don't... No, not that one. The following. Yeah. The number of registrar's based oh, in the country, I just didn't for UK, I don't see anyone. I didn't have the information um, to go through 4,000. What I did instead was I looked at how many on the list appeared in the ICANN accredited list. It was only 20 at that time. I think it's now more, more like 25 or 30. So because there's no requirements, for some, some CCTLDs will require that their registrars are based in country. And, it's very, and, and some of them, like Netherlands, publish it. Okay. The UK just doesn't publish it. So that's the reason. A mundane day together in this month. Could you please give examples of one of your other services? Yeah, like um, web design, hosting, um, yeah. certification, um, oh. even basic DNS um, of your registry will not be providing. Some and provide the, that, yeah, some you know some registries will provide a lot of services mm -hmm. attuned to their market and attuned to the, the maturity of the market elsewhere. This is, I really would hate you uh, to um, feel that I'm kind of like projecting one model because the, the, you know, Giovanni and I have worked with CCTLDs for 15 years or more. And one thing that you understand very quickly is the diversity is what is the essence of the CCTLD environment. 
the fact that it isn't one size fits all, and that CCTLDs are often making a very important uh, step in their own local environment, and they're much more aware of local needs and local um, conditions than any kind of you know somebody floating around from somewhere else. So uh, please take that as read. Um, I just wanted to recap on these. We talked about how domain names are part of those very small number, really, of critical internet resources on which the internet really relies, uh, the single internet relies. But there are different types of domain names, or on my side, they're both called GTLDs, but if they were in fact meant to be called GTLDs and CCTLDs. Um, but domain name registrations are uneven. You know, they aren't evenly distributed throughout the world, and there may be lots and lots of different reasons for this. Um, but there are different models of country code registries, um, uh, but the, the local registry, the CCTLD, I think, does have an important part to play in nurturing the development of the internet industries in its local environment, and can very quickly become globally known. So I do think, you know, start local, think global. So I just wanted to, in the last five minutes, and then we can have our break, to introduce the case study. I made up um, a country for us to work on because I thought it was just, for uh, using the wonders of Photoshop, I planted it there in the middle of the Red Sea, and apologies if that creates any problems, and I gave it its own top level domain, which is- Is it the case for Hmm? Is it the case for should we, should we say that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, it's dot PJ, Panjazeera. Um, here are some uh, fictional um, uh, statistics about this fictional country. So it's a population of about 1.5 million, which based on the size of the dot that I placed in the university, I think it's quite, quite densely populated, actually. Um, it's, it's GDP rank is about 40, so it's sort of middle ranking. Internet penetration is about kind of typical for the region, looking across different uh, experiences. It's, it's, you know, nudging up to 70%, doing pretty well, actually, for internet penetration. Literacy to secondary school and above is about 80%, so you've got a sort of reasonably well-educated population. And cultural homogeneity, sort of typical of the of the region in one way, in that you know you'll have a kind of a basin of of um, one type of of culture, and also migrant workers and visitors and all sorts. Broadband penetration about forty percent. Again, that's fairly typical for the region. Somehow, my fictional country has managed to get itself an internet exchange point, which is fairly rare. Um, and just showing how forward thinking it is, but IP address um, allocation in, in the country is still at the low to moderate level. So PJ Nick, I think it's probably the department of the of the regulator. I think that's probably fairly uh, plausible. It's offering a restricted. Um, domain name uh, policy, so the CCTLD requires you to be resident, locally registered organisations only, so no individuals are allowed to register, one domain name per applicant, and it must match the organisation name. And these are all actually examples of real policies that are out there. These are all, I've seen them all in play in Europe at various points in time, and um, I'm sure that some of them will be familiar to you. So you have to make a fax to the to the registry. This is a real example based on the European registry that Giovanni and I are both familiar with. Uh, it's back in the day, and these are manually checked uh, by registry staff, and the whole thing takes about three weeks. Um, <laughs> registry fees are eighty dollars, and they retail. Although they have no um, registrars. They do retail through sort of any reseller who wants to kind of offer everything, does offer .pj domains, and they're retailing at about $300. So annual income actually um, is about uh, $400,000, I think that works. 
because there are 5,000 to make eggs, going with 80, 80 a pot. That sounded like a lot, so maybe I got a naught wrong. But I, I did it several times. And they also have the IDN CCTLD, which has about 130 something registrations. But meanwhile, lots, pretty much everybody on the internet in Panjazeera is also on Facebook. And about a third of them are on Twitter. You know, working away like crazy, creating content and communicating with each other on the internet using these social networks. They would tend to use their local language in order to do so in communicating with each other and in communicating with their government. So this is the sort of environment that we've kind of made up that we can all perform surgery on in the next two sessions as we start to think about how could we, how could we um, change this registry. Um, and um, so apologies in advance if it's not a particularly realistic level. I've tried to, to use data that's reasonably standard for the region. Um, but also to make it an inventive place so that we can be very free in our thinking and we won't feel attached to any particular um, outcome. That's it. It's now time um, for coffee break. Uh, what's your estimation for the road the broadband? I mean, something from which speed is broadband in your point of view? Well, I think it's, it's probably um, a bit less. Um, precise and um, the, the ITU actually do very good and consistent um, statistics keeping on broadband penetration and it's their data that I go to for broadband penetration. I think it's literally not using dial up is the not using, using dial up is, is basically have you got an X some sort of ADSL type of service and the speeds with we're, we're dealing with the slow speeds right up super, super fast, but it would all be broadband. But um, for those of you dealing with dial-up, um, you know, get, once you make that step from dial-up to broadband, even at the slowest broadband rates, it's such a different experience. <coughs> and, that, and that you can uh, enjoy much more. I think that the reason why people track broadband penetration is because of the sort of um, media that you can enjoy more fully. You can use voice, you can you can watch movies more or less, you can kind of download songs more or less, and you're not any longer restricted to that very text-based environment. I just want to I just want to make sure that I'm not so fancy in, 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 no, in the like problem. Totally so this is realistic. Yes. So this is realistic yes. and this is uh, I've been trying to kind of um, because part of our IDM study that we do every year is we're looking at other factors in different countries and regions, including broadband penetration. And so rather than making up my own definition, I kind of go to the, to the big kind of trusted agencies uh, to look at those statistics. I can buy anything that is below 10 megabits per second that is not anymore considered to be broadband. Really? Yeah. really? I mean they and it's, you know, it's amazing to, to consider that given what we've probably all experienced. Yeah, you? but I mean, they're saying that if you are below that, people see you have yeah. You have dropouts and hangs. Yeah, I think that's probably realistic. Okay, so thank you for your patience. Yeah, we started a bit late and ran over a bit, but thank you also for all your active participation, yeah, which is, is fantastic. So let's have a break and some coffee. When are we re. Is, uh, the we're going to be back in uh, 15 minutes more, 30 minutes, so we're going to next session of you uh, here today about how to adapt to policies, what you need to do, who you need to think about talking to, um, and so on. So this is the sort of menu. First of all, we just have a bit of um, definition of terms and terms. What, what are we talking about? What are examples of policies and procedures in the domain name context? And then think about the very broad choices that can be made in terms of policies. Um, now, in a CCTLD environment, the country codes 
who makes policy and how? Well, on the one hand, you know that it isn't um, strongly tied to the ICANN uh, process, but at the same time, um, individual countries may have their own uh, regulatory environment or their own structure, so everybody's will be a little bit different. Um, so I, I hope that we can, um, but nevertheless, think about ways of, um, of approaching policy making which should work in any environment. And I'm sure having had the discussions this morning, you won't hesitate to tell me when I make a wrong assumption and I really would encourage you to keep, please, participating. But of course when you make any change, and, and as some of you I was talking to some colleagues in the break about kind of embarking on the process of change, you not only have to think about your future and what it will be, but also about how you manage your past and how you cope with the legacy that you already have, which have been perhaps registered under a different regime, under a different set of rules. And then, you know, we can think about managing blocked or reserved names. Um, we've already been talking a bit about trademark issues here uh, and about communication, which will feed into sessions a bit later in the week. And then we'll continue with our fictional case study and start to think about how we could um, uh, make some policy changes to the panjazeera.pj registry. Okay, so what do we mean by registry policies and procedures? And, and it's quite interesting that several of you coming from a network engineering background, um, there's often quite a divide even in such a small industry between people who work on the policy side and people who work on the technical side or the operational side. But of course this is quite um, misleading in a way because policy choices like technical choices have enormous impact and can have an impact right the way through <coughs> the operations the technical and the financial aspects of your business of your registry as in most things in life no policy <coughs> is the single best answer nothing is perfect Usually you solve one problem and create another problem that often you didn't anticipate. We, we are fortunate now at this point in time in that we can look back at what others have done and often it's just as instructive to look at things that didn't work out as it is to look at things that you admire and that you'd like to learn from. But I think that um, you know, the first thing to do is to figure out what you actually want to achieve. Now, some people will say, I want my, my CCTLD to be a safe environment, it's got to be trusted, it's very much part of our local environment. And if that is your policy direction, that, that then certain things will flow from that. You will need to make sure that you can guarantee that quality, that you can build that trust and that you can make sure that things are running as they should. You might equally, I was talking to some colleagues in the break, have a growth strategy. We want to get more domain name registrations in our country by one year, two years. If that is your objective, then we know from the experiences of others the, the sort of things that you need to look at in order to drive that growth. Um, you know, do you want money or do you not really care about the money? All of these will have their consequences and will feed into your choices. But as with any change process, you know, for anybody who's done management, of type, you'll be familiar with these circles where you sort of, you plan, you do, and then you review, and then you keep on monitoring how you are doing and keep being prepared to change because this is like anything in life, this is a complex environment and sometimes the things that we think are going to have a rational consequence don't always have uh, the, the result we hoped. So let's start with, you know, what do we mean by a policy? Let's have an example. The, the most fundamental business, we're in domain names. 
who can be a registrant? Um, what do they need to, you know, what do they need to uh, have? Do they, where do they need to live? Do they need to be living in your um, local environment? Do they need to prove that they have rights in the stream in order to register to start with? Or don't you care? Um, is there anything that we don't want registrants uh, to do with their domain name? In which case we need to think about those policies. So what sort of, what sort of choices do we have in a registration policy? Let's think about who, who could be the registrant. Either the natural persons or companies or in the laws. Yeah. yeah. Or That's right. So we can have natural persons, which is any one of us in our own name. Companies incorporated, as you said, NGOs. Which is this block in now? Somebody's proactive. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to make active use of the sort of what sort of do you, do you require that sort of use of the name? Yeah. yeah. Do you have? I mean, in some jurisdictions, there is a concept of an unincorporated entity. You know, just sort of two people, or you know, just a very flexible thing. I'm not sure whether that's that applies. I'm seeing some nods. You know, and so there's a sort of the the policy choices you tend to see are. Sometimes you see, like the Norwegian registry for a long time didn't allow individuals to register, only companies. And some will, will say only a registered company based in our jurisdiction. Yeah. And also for IDEN, we should consider the issue of homographic. That one character had many variants. So we should consider this in the registration process. For example, in, in Dotmas, if the registrant tries to register a domain name that has value, he has all exclusive rights to register all the value with the same value. That's a very good point. I don't know if you, um, if you picked up that, but if you're dealing with a, a, an IDN registry, Arabic script registry, there are also issues to do with so we've been talking about who can be the dom domain name registrant. There's also a set of uh, considerations about what should be the domain name. Does it look alike? Are there variant character variants that we need to think about managing? Is there potential confusion on that side? And we also have, I mean, you might have a, uh, a domain structure that would be different requirements at different levels. So you can have a com and that to go and so on, not, not this CID, and yeah. based on that, we'll have different requirements. That's a, that's a very good point, and something that one sees quite a lot in the region as well, is a, and something that, say, .uk there is as well, is a sort of a level of second levels like com.pj, mm -hmm. or gov.pj, and yeah. so on. Okay, what is the, the, the thing that required from registrar? For the most, we explain that the registrar should have a local, local address here in Asia. Okay. How many other registries have a requirement for the registrar to have a local address? For the register? To, to, yeah, to register. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you have a local address? Mm -hmm. So, so, so mixture, do you require the yeah, only, for the second only for the second level, but if there is some level of, is something that, that some people require? Does, does anybody not require a registrant to have a local address? Okay, so there's a mixture even within the room. It's a choice. What would be the benefits of having a local address? Uh, I can contact them. You can contact them if there's a dispute. Do you know which jurisdiction you're dealing with? What are the benefits of not having a local address? Open the door. Open. Open the door. <laughs> so it goes back to our objectives, doesn't it? What do we want? Do we want... We, you know, if we say, well, my thing is to grow my numbers, open the door. Okay? And does it cause you 
operational problems in real life? Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> do you have to? <coughs> yeah. Sorry, do you have a question? Yeah, um, I really don't think there should be a dispute if you have an open door policy because um, you, do, you have to operate within the jurisdiction of the CCTL. That's right. So, it depend, you know, even if you have an address outside of the region, if you're registering in Nigeria, then you agree that you're you're sort of bought into the territory, and you know you're buying a little bit of the territory anyway. So that's right. You can manage the sort of having people outside of the the country or region through contractual terms, yeah. exactly, and to make sure that they sign into their jurisdiction. How often is it a problem in tracking people down? Well, what's a problem? Ah, <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I don't know. It'd be interesting to listen to colleagues here in the room because often with domain name disputes, the whole process takes place entirely virtually. So there's nobody actually going and hammering at a door serving legal process. Yeah, PHL has a problem finding some addresses because they don't exist. <laughs> the phone numbers are wrong. <laughs> yes, and, and actually um, a requirement to have good address details is something that you see right across different registries um, internationally and in the GTLD space. Having a requirement doesn't mean you always have the, the, um, the, the good address. Um, but what about, do, do, do we care if the registrant has rights in the domain name up front? So there are two broad choices. You can say just register it and we'll sort out any problems afterwards. Or you can say, I want to make sure that you actually have the right to use this name. So. It all depends on your regulatory requirements. I mean, if the trademark is protected within the country and they consider the domain to be part of the trademark, then you're stuck. You're stuck. You have to provide the rights. Yeah. And because um, if you have any litigations, the trademark owner is always the winner. Mm -hmm. And you don't want somebody to start a business using a domain that he cannot use or he would lose. So, um, that's right, so it will <coughs> depend on your national laws, it will depend on whether you've got any particular uh, regulations that apply to the domain name uh, regis uh, registry. But I, ho I hope that kind of gives you a, a flavour of the sort of choices that you make. I mean, a lot of these will be incredibly familiar to you, but I think that it's helpful to, to go back to, well, what are our objectives here? What are our constraints? Are there things that we might want to do that we can't do legally? Um, okay, let's then you that have to either accept that or, or try to change it in its own way. Um, yeah. uh, do you need a cycle? So uh, if, the, if the domain is fired, I just want mm. to be notified maybe by SMS, maybe by the I'm going to come on to a real-life example of that. Um, that's a very good point. You know, how long is the registration period for? What happens at the end of that registration <coughs> period? So, if the domain name registrant doesn't want the domain name anymore and they just let it go, does it end up being cancelled? What if somebody else picks it up? Do you worry, or do you just let things, you know, play out? Uh, what are your choices then? Can I ask? Yes, of course. Um, <coughs> uh, as a registry, um, especially on rights, um, does no one has a right to get a domain name from a registry. Uh, you can deny anyone. Is is that the correct approach? I think that probably is the correct approach. Um, you know, obviously, it will depend on your local laws and your particular environment. It's very um, 